trying, but um, I don't know if we're going to get it going. So anyway, okay, just an update you. on that. All right. Well, hi, ladies. Um, I'm happy to be here this morning. My name is Whitney Aiken. Um, I, I taught here a couple years ago now, probably on Mother's Day. Mm -hmm. So I remember some of your faces. Um, some are new faces. So um, I thought I'd tell you just a little bit about myself. Most people don't know me, um, but they know my husband because he uh, plays guitar every Sunday and sings. So I'm just known as Eli's wife, which is fine with me. That's fine. Um, I have three kids who are 10, 8, and 5, and they're in promotion Sunday this morning. So they're moving on up to fifth grade, third grade, and kindergarten. Um, and yeah, I'm an author and a Bible teacher, and I just love to do this. So I'm really thankful Letitia asked me because I enjoy this very much. So thank you guys for having me in the gentle spirits today. So I thought we could just start off with a word of prayer. Is that okay with you guys? All right. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for the ladies here in person and online. God, thank you for the opportunity to gather together and the blessing that that is. God, I pray for um, uh, this lesson that you would teach us in your word. God, that you would grow us in our understanding of you and um, that you would grow us um, in our spiritual walk, Lord, as we gather together to learn about you. Give me the words to say in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So Letitia kind of filled me in that y'all been going through the book of Acts. And the last lesson she said y'all did in Acts was on Acts chapter six. Does anybody remember Acts chapter six? Yeah. Just pop quiz. No. Um, <laughs> the church in Acts chapter six was expanding. So you have Pentecost, you know, first the disciples are hiding from everyone. Then Jesus rises again and it's confirmed that they're not crazy. And then Pentecost happens and the Holy Spirit comes down. The church just grows. It just booms and it's expanding. And in chapter six, we meet someone important named Stephen. Does anybody want to just tell me like what you know about Stephen? Just any, just call it out. Anything you know about Stephen? Young. Okay. He's young. What else? Fire for the Lord. He's on fire for the Lord. What else? He's the first martyr. He's the first martyr of the Christian church. Very important detail about Stephen. Anything else you want to add, anybody? He did great wonders and miracles. Yeah, he went out. Um, he was really filled with the Holy Spirit. He was doing wonders and miracles. Okay, so that's right. So in chapter seven, we see something important about Stephen. He's gone out and like done all these miracles. He's telling about the gospel. And they're like, mm, we don't know what this guy's doing. So the Jewish church takes him in and says, Stephen, you need to kind of explain what's going on here. So it basically goes before council of the Sanhedrin, which would be like if one of us went before the elders of a church. Okay. And he's kind of having to give his um, justification for being out there and preaching. And he's talking to the Sanhedrin or the elders, but he's also surrounded by like a bunch of other just Jewish church members listening in. And Stephen does this incredible, if you read chapter seven, it's really beautiful, like a high level overview of the redemptive work uh, of the history of the Bible, starting with Abraham. And these Jews would have known all this, right? This is familiar territory. But then as he gets toward the end, he starts to make clear that the redemptive work that's going on has been fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. And then he calls them out because they didn't believe in Jesus and this calling out by Stephen is a very bold thing to do. And it makes Stephen, I mean, it makes the crowd really upset at Stephen because they're probably offended. But more than that, they believe that this is blasphemous. And so they choose to stone Stephen, which is as bad as it sounds. They throw rocks at him until he dies. Okay. So this is like, was just pointed out. Stephen is the first martyr of the church. So I want us to go to chapter seven in Acts, if you're not already there. And, and I want someone, did you guys like to read in here? We got readers? Okay, good. I want someone um, to read chapter 7, verse, just verse 58. Can someone do that for me? Yeah, chapter 7 of Acts, of Acts uh -huh, verse 58. I have it in front of me. All right, go for it. Let me make sure my glasses are reading the thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, is it while they were, am I reading them right? While they were stoning him? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Keep going. Then he fell on his knee and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he said this, he fell asleep. 
Okay, thank you, Letitia. I actually meant the verse before, but that's a great verse. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry about that. But yes, yeah, okay. so we see what Letitia just read us Stephen's death, which is this merciful, kind of beautiful moment where the Bible says that he fell asleep. And so God has mercy on Stephen in this martyrdom. Um, but right before that, in, in verse 58, it says that as they were stoning Stephen, the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And so this is our first introduction to a guy named Saul in the Bible. And Saul is who? Paul. Paul, right? Okay, so if you don't know Saul, you probably likely know Paul if you're familiar with scripture. And we know Paul is this great apostle in the New Testament. Um, but this is the same guy right here. Um, and this is our first introduction, which is kind of a sinister introduction. Like he's over in the background while Stephen's being stoned and people are laying down their garments before him as an act of respect so that they're going to be uh, going with Saul and what he says. Now, a lot of people think that Saul to Paul was like Abram to Abraham or Sarai to Sarah. But is that not true? Saul and Paul are just two ways to say the same name. His name wasn't like change. So it's like... um. If your name's David in the States, you're David. But if you go down to, you know, Central America, you're David. Okay. So it's like that. Like, it just depends on what language you you spoke, whether you call him Saul or Paul. So I'm going to call him Paul the whole time because that's how I know him. And I think it's kind of good to call him Paul the whole time in some ways because it reminds us where this guy came from. Sometimes we forget where he started. Okay. So then I want us to go on into chapter eight. And could somebody read for me Acts chapter eight, just verse one. And at that time, there was great prosecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Yeah, so we see a great scattering of the church that had been growing. Now, because of the persecution that's happened with Stephen, there's a fear that's spreading through the church. There's a real reality that the Jewish church is going to come after Christians. And we read in the very beginning of chapter 8 that Saul or Paul approved of the execution of Stephen. And, and so we see that Paul is a man on a mission. And he's really, really zealous for Judaism. Like we haven't seen someone this zealous for Judaism yet. We've seen leaders who really care about it. We've seen Pharisees when Jesus was walking there who argue with Jesus a lot. But we haven't seen somebody who's like this intense about Judaism. So if we go a little bit farther down in chapter 8 to verse 3, we see, and my, my version says, Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. And so Paul's mission here, ravaging, maybe in your um, version, it might say destroying, right? So Paul is going, his mission is to destroy the church. That's his mission. And so if we take that in our context, like if someone decided in our world, like, I'm going to destroy the church. And they began to go church to church and arrest people. It'd be like somebody walked in our auditorium here at New Hope and came down the aisle and just demanded a row to stand up and put handcuffs on them and took them out the door. Nobody could do anything to stop them because it was sanctioned that it was okay for them to do that. I mean, we would call that injustice and oppression. We might even call that terrorism. Um, this is this is like really serious. And so we see too that Paul understands the Christian church because the Christian church is not like the Jewish synagogue or the temple, this place where they would all gather together. The Christian church is meeting in houses because they've been scattered um, and because they're kind of all over the city. And so imagine if Letitia said, y'all, it's really not safe to go to New Hope and meet together because, you know, we can't be seen all gathered. But y'all can come to my house and we're going to meet in my living room. You probably, oh, that's a lot of y'all. You might have to split into two house churches. But you're going to come meet in my living room. And you knew that when you did that, there was a chance that you'd hear a really big knock on Letitia's door while you were gathering for your worship. And then it says that Paul understood that they were house churches, but he also did this thing. It says that he dragged men and women out of their homes and put them in jail, which is like a very descriptive in piece of information that we have. And I think if we just think about it for a second, like what kind of man do you have to be to go into someone's home and drag a woman out of her home and throw her in jail? Because the idea of dragging is the idea that the people are resisting, right? It's like pulling them, kicking and screaming. And so Paul is going and doing this house to house. And so if we put ourselves in the shoes of this early church, when you were going to someone's house to gather, you're going to go pray. 
You're going to go sing some songs. You're going to go hear the word. You're going to remind yourself of Jesus and his life and why you're doing this. You're going to, you're going to um, be in fellowship with your brothers and sisters. But the whole time you do it, you know that when you step out of your house and you go to that church house, you might not ever come home right? Because someone may knock at the door and someone may bust down the door and then somebody may come in and choose you to drag out and take you to jail. And I think that that is a very sobering thought. And they were still gathering together, even with that reality, which is incredible. And so we can understand from this little bit of information that Paul does not just kind of intellectually disagree with Christianity. He doesn't just think those people are wrong and I'm right. He is violent, right? Mm -hmm. He is enraged toward this religion and he's become like a vigilante for judaism like but not like batman is a vigilante for justice in the night like he's a villainous vigilante okay and because of this he's like legitimately feared by the christian church um, he's a bad dude and they're scared of him but paul is not okay with just keeping it in jerusalem so at this point remember the church has grown in jerusalem they're really um stationed there but in the persecution they begin to scatter and they begin to kind of go out to cities around jerusalem they go as far away as a hundred miles out to a city north of jerusalem called damascus which is a, a little over a hundred miles away from jerusalem and they're trying to get away from the persecution but continue to meet together and paul knows this because he studies his victims right and he knows that they have spread and so he's maybe done all he can do in jerusalem and he thinks i need to I need to take this gig on the road. I'm going to go to Damascus. But he doesn't just decide to go to Damascus. He goes first to the church, to the high priest in the Jewish church. And he says, here's my plan. It's like a, it's like a shark tank pitch. Like, here's what I want to do. And they're like, we love it. We love it. We're going to support you. We're going to give you letters. You take to the synagogue, tell the synagogue up there that we support you. You have our full approval to go and do this, Paul. And so Paul leaves to travel to Damascus. And because this isn't like a quiet secret, the church is approving it. We could probably assume that the Christian church in Damascus caught word of this too. And while they were probably up there praying for their brothers and sisters down in Jerusalem who are being persecuted, now things have shifted and that persecution is coming to them. And so I imagine they are rightly on alert and pretty scared of what's going to happen when this guy Paul makes it to Damascus. But we know that something happened on the way to Damascus, right? Something big happened on the road to Damascus. We know that line, the road to Damascus experience, right? And so this is where we're going to pick up today. This is what we're going to read. And it's in Acts 9. So I want, are there two women who are willing to read a good little section of scripture for me? The two volunteers, if you, if you want to raise your, okay, well, I got one. Got one more? Two. Okay. So this is what I want to do. I want to read this scripture like a tale of two men okay so we got our man here is paul that's our first man and we got our man over here and this is ananias this is our second man so paul i'm gonna have you read acts chapter 9 verses 1 through 9 and when you're done right after her ananias over here you're going to pick up and read chapter i mean verses 10 through 19 of chapter 9 does that make sense so right after she's done all right go for it paul and on um, my book starts off as the master's role paul converted now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters for him to, to, to the synagogue at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching, as he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city and it will be told you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground and though, though his eyes were open, he could not see anything. He could not see nothing. And leading by the hand, they brought him into Damascus, and he was there three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Adonai. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Adonai. And he said, Behold, I am the Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the streets, which is called Street, 
and inquire in the homes of students for one five song of Francis for the fool to pray. And has seen in a vision of my name Ananias coming in and out of him, coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight in my name. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went to the gate and entered into the home, and putting his hand on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way, as thou camest, has sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell on him, they fell from his eyes as it had been seen, and he received sight towards him, and arose and was protected. And when he had received me, he, he was threatened, then was saw certain things that in sample which were at the house. Thank you so much, ladies. All right. So we have a profile of two men in this scripture. We have Paul and we have Ananias. And so I want us to start with a little bit of a profile of Paul. So we've learned a lot about Paul already this morning. What did this passage add to that information? Does anybody have anything that felt like was added about Paul in this passage? I think he uh, and he must have power. Mm. Yeah. He was humble. He was humble, for sure. Yeah. Despite all the things that he did, God chose him. Yes. That's right. It's pretty incredible, isn't it? Yeah. All right. So here's a few things I thought about. Um, we know that Paul was an enemy. We've kind of already addressed that, but this text gives us this crazy description. Luke wrote the book of Acts. Luke is a great writer. He's very detailed. Remember, he's a physician. So he, he, he throws in some really great writing. I'm a writer, so I really enjoy that. But one of the things he says in the very first part of this verse is Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. So we get a little bit more information here because before it's just, hey, Paul wants to throw you in jail. But here it's this idea that Paul would be happy if they were all dead. He hates them. Remember that Jesus said, if you even hate someone in your heart, it's like you've killed them. He hates Christians. And when Luke says that he's breathing it out, breathing is an involuntary action, right? And it's something that we do all day long. And so Paul is never stopping hating the Christians. It is part of who he is. And he eats and sleeps and breathes this hatred toward them. This is... A clear description, Paul is an enemy of God's church, of God's disciples. And, and then we see, again, this Paul is back. So we know that he went to the high priest. We know that they said, go for it. We know that they gave him letters to send to the synagogue. But here we see, if you notice, when he's on the Damascus Road, he's not alone, right? He's not on a lone mission. There's a whole group of people with him, a whole group of men. And it says that they, they could see the light, but they couldn't really understand the voices. So what this tells us is that Paul is like, he, it's like a, a an organized effort to go do what he's doing. It's not just one man with one idea. This is sanctioned and organized, and it's coming to Damascus. And then Wait, we see, yeah, yes. I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm raising my hand. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to say something about how how Luke uses the words um, "still breathing out murderous threats." Because one of the things that we've been talking about in our class is that some of the secret conversations and things we we kind of believe and, and have studied that that Paul was the one who gave Luke those inside that inside information. Mm -hmm. And so to 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 think about them sitting down having this conversation and thinking about Paul himself saying, I had murderous thoughts. Yes. You know, just that part, because that didn't come just from Luke's imagination. Luke wasn't there. He he wasn't right. a witness of one of those things. So it had to come. Paul had to say, I had murderous thoughts that I thought about day and night. I hated them. Yes. Yeah, I, just thought, I just thought that was, yeah. 
Yeah, that is a great point. Yeah, ma'am. Yeah. So then the, uh, the, the third thing we see that you guys talked about is that Paul was disrupted in quite a big way, right? Something happened and Paul was not planning on this thing happening and he was totally disrupted in his mission. So what happens is it's, it's the middle of the day, he's traveling on the road to Damascus and it's bright outside, but this light comes that's very much brighter than the light of the sun. It's an otherworldly light. So in my mind, I just think of like a UFO with the beam that comes down, you know, they're like, <laughs> um, so it's like this thing that happens and like, you know, immediately like, this is not normal. I don't know what's going on, but this is not normal. And, and so Paul is really startled and the text says that he falls down, he falls onto the road, the road's dusty, like he's trembling, he falls on his face. And, and then something even more incredible happens because the light talks all right and who who can find in the text what does the light say to paul very first thing it says since it's in verse four yeah saul saul why are you persecuting me which is a great line we're gonna come back to that line it's a really important line and then he's still confused so what is his response who are, who are you who are you what is going on take me to your leader like what are we doing right and the answer is what yeah he said lord who are you lord he knows that someone is more powerful than he is right and what's the answer i am jesus who you are persecuting okay we're going to get back to that line who you're persecuting but first we're going to just focus on this i am jesus so hold up just a second Paul believes Jesus is a fraud with everything inside of him. He believes Jesus. He knows Jesus existed. Paul did not live in the time of Jesus. He's come afterwards. Jesus had already died, resurrected and ascended to heaven. But Paul knows all about Jesus. And he believes that Jesus is a liar, a cheat, a con man and a fraud. There is nothing in Paul that believes Jesus is real. And he has staked his whole ministry, his whole life on this idea that Jesus is a fraud. And I think that Jesus just really ticked Paul off. Like, I just think the whole thing about Jesus just ticked him off because, you know, Paul was a, he was born a Jew. He tells us about himself that he, he was raised as a Pharisee and he was trained under, I always say it wrong, but Gamaliel. Okay. He's like the the Pharisee of all Pharisees. It'd be like if we learn gymnastics from Simone Biles, right? We know what we're talking about because we learn from the best. So this is Paul. He is a Pharisee himself. And what some things we know about Pharisees, like Pharisees loved the law, which meant they knew the Old Testament scripture up and down. Um, they really valued liturgical practices in the church. So they really cared about how the worship service went down in the temple. And um, they, they really valued cleansing rituals. Uh, which was to keep yourself pure before God, which kind of all sounds pretty good, except they had taken all of these things and just perverted them into a way that it was just instead of scripturally based, it was all man-made tradition based. Extreme. Extreme, right? And Jesus says they heap burdens on top of you, right? Mm -hmm. And so, but Paul, he has all this, this is his core belief system. And then this, this man named Jesus has come into the picture before Paul was a, a Pharisee. And Jesus says things like, um, Hey, you know, that Sabbath day that you hold so dear that you say is in the law. Well, my disciples can eat on the Sabbath day. You don't understand the Sabbath. You're getting it wrong. And then he says things like, um, I'm going to destroy this temple and rebuild it in three days. That's the temple. That's where they have their worship. Service. What are we talking about? How could you say that? And he says uh, in Mark 1, there's a leper. And Jesus says this really, really radical thing where he heals the leper, which is, okay, a miracle. But then he tells the leper, go, you're healed and you're made clean. Only the priest could make someone clean. How could he say that to them? So Paul knows all this and, and he's thinking, Jesus just flies in the face of everything I believe. And then Paul knows that Jesus was convicted and he was crucified. So Paul feels pretty justified in this idea that Jesus was a fraud because he doesn't believe in the resurrection, right? But these people that follow him just will not stop. They just will not give up and it just ticks Paul off. And then he needs Jesus. He says, I am Jesus. And there was no part of Paul before this that believed that Jesus was the son of God, which was the claim, right? That put him on the cross. No part of Paul believed that. But in this moment, the light is so otherworldly, it must be divine. And Paul has this really cool moment in Acts chapter 22. And it's the same story as Acts chapter nine, except that Paul is telling this story before a council, kind of like Stephen was. 
And so he's telling this account, kind of like Letitia was talking about. It's not Luke writing it now. It's Paul telling it from his, I mean, Luke's writing it, but it's Paul telling it from its own perspective. And in that account, Paul gives us like this one little tidbit that I think is really important that's not here in chapter nine. Mm -hmm. um, and so in, in, in chapter 22, verse nine, it says, now those who are with me saw the light, but didn't understand it. We already heard that. And the voice of the one who was speaking to me, and this is a little detail that's added in, in verse 10. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? So he adds a little line that's not there in, in chapter nine. It's like, who are you? I'm Jesus who you're persecuting. And then he says, what shall I do? Lord? And what this shows us is that when he meets Jesus, he doesn't say, prove it, Jesus. I want to be, I'm, I'm, I want to see the nail scars in your hands, right? I'm like, Thomas, I need to know. He doesn't say, um, where, where are your disciples trying to set this thing up? Is there a spotlight somewhere? Like I gotta see behind this fraud as I know this is not true, right? He doesn't ask for a sign because I think he's receiving a sign right there in the moment. <laughs> in the All he does in that moment is split second is he surrenders. What shall I do? So Paul has built a lifetime as a Pharisee of legalism mm -hmm. and it is transformed in a second with the real savior who he realizes is everything he always said he was. And so Jesus tells him, this is what you need to do. Paul, you need to go to the city. Keep going to Damascus. And then I'm, I'm going to tell you what to do. Um, but, you know, his journey to Damascus after that was probably pretty hard because he was blind. And I think the blindness here is really important because the blindness shows us something about the brightness. Um, and it reminds me of Hebrews chapter one. I don't know if you all are familiar with the little, little tiny paragraph at the beginning of Hebrews chapter one. Um, it's not long but it's really deep and it's basically a description of jesus and who he is it might be one of the most complete succinct descriptions of who jesus is in the new testament and one of the lines in hebrews chapter one says the sun is the radiance of god's glory and the exact representation of his being and so when i read that word radiance i think like that's such a powerful word and I love that word. It's so beautiful. And I think like we might Christianize it up a little bit. Y'all know what I mean when I say that? Like we use it in Christian circles a lot. So what I did with that word is I was like, I just want to like, what does this really mean? Sometimes I just want to know the definition and not, not in a concordance. I just want to Google it. So I Googled radiance and this is just the first definition that popped up. Uh, radiance is defined as light or heat emitted or reflected by something. So if you've ever been at the beach and you can see, you know, just that horizon so beautiful. And then there's usually like a storm cloud in the distance. And then that sun ray will just like come through the cloud. It's so beautiful. Like it's just gorgeous. And probably if you were standing wherever that sun ray was hitting, it'd be really hot. You could feel the heat from it. You could see the light of it. Um, and you know that that is the radiance of the sun. The sun is much, much hotter, much, much brighter, but you're seeing the radiance of it in that sun ray. And so Hebrews tells us Jesus is like this. Jesus is like the sun ray to the sun. He is the radiance coming out of the Father. And so that brightness that Paul saw, I believe with all my heart, was the radiance of God the Father through Jesus Christ the Son. Mm -hmm. So if that light was blinding, can you even begin to imagine the light of the Father? Mm -hmm. Right? And so it's kind of like in the summer when you're outside and you walk back in the house and it takes a couple minutes for you to adjust, like it's like that times a million because Paul's eyes can't adjust back because that brightness is so bright. He's blinded. And it's not just the light. It's the radiance. It's the glory of God. It's transformative. So this is where we leave Paul in verse nine. He's blind. He's going on into Damascus. He's going to wait. He is transformed because now he knows he was wrong about everything. Jesus is the son of God and everything's going to change from here on out. And then the text turns to this other guy named Ananias. Okay. So what do you guys learn about Ananias from the text? Can you tell me a few things we know about Ananias? Ananias uh, was afraid. <laughs> He was afraid. Yep. <laughs> yep. He's a believer. He's afraid. Anything else want to add? The Lord appeared to him. He was obedient. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we see, just like y'all said, we see that Ananias, he's a disciple. 
Um, we know this because the text tells us he's a disciple. Um, but we know this also because of the way Ananias behaves. So there's this moment where God comes to him in a vision or Jesus comes to him in a vision. And Ananias is a disciple because Ananias is listening. When God talks to him and calls his name, he doesn't go like, did y'all hear that? <laughs> Am I crazy? What, what was that? No, he doesn't do that. He responds much like Noah or Abraham or Samuel or Moses responded. What does he say? Do you guys remember? Can you look back in the text? What does he say when God calls him? Yes, Lord, here I am. Yes, Lord. Yeah, he's ready to go. Okay, I heard you, God. Yes, Lord. Yes. And so we see he's a disciple because he's intimate with the Lord. He's listening. He's ready to hear from God. He's not surprised when God talks to him and he's ready to respond to God, right? But like Letitia said, He's got some questions, right? Because we've just established who Paul is. And so God tells him, hey, Paul's going to come to you and you're going to pray for him. And he's thinking, mm, I don't think I want to do that. I'm not sure you understand the situation, God. And so Ananias begins to ask God some really tough and honest and blunt questions. And I think that also shows his intimacy with God. Because the closer you are with the Lord, the more you realize he's not scared by our questions. He's not going to smite us or strike us with a bolt of lightning, right? Um, he welcomes our question. We cannot take him off guard or surprise him with our questions. And so it shows us that Ananias here, he is very intimate with the Lord. He's a, he's a close disciple of Jesus. Um, and so, but I love, I love how Ananias in this text begins to explain to God about Paul as if God doesn't really know who Paul really is, right? Hey, look, I mean, you don't understand. He's coming here. He's persecuting Christians. He's come with the authority of the church. God, I'm not sure you really want me to invite this guy. And I think that that's so relevant for us. Um, I, I can think of so many times in my life where I have argued with God. I'm an arguer <laughs> where I had tried to explain to God back the situation because I'm just not sure that he really gets it. And um, for me, I'll share a personal story. Um, when my, hus my husband and I have a ministry called M25 Barbecue, it's an outreach ministry. We started it full-time a couple of years ago. Before that, he was also in full-time ministry, music ministry with his family. And uh, God began to kind of work and lead to say, uh, we had already been doing M25, but it was like, it's time to go full time. It's time to start your own nonprofit and do this thing. And I was like, I don't think you understand, Lord. Like, we're going to have to walk away from our salary and our insurance and our retirement and, and the life we've always known since I got married at 20 years old. This is what I've always known. I don't think you understand. And I spent a long time explaining it back to God. Like just, I kept saying over, I mean, he must have been tired. He probably just put me on hold, you know, I'm still talking. He just set the phone down. Like I'm explaining to God over and over and over why this is a really bad idea. And so I want to point out that Ananias's story is good for us because we can get stuck in that place where we kind of just tell God over and over and over why his plan is wrong. Um, but Ananias tells his concerns and then he listens to what God's answer is. And I don't know that he loved what God's answer was after his concerns. It was still, no, Ananias, go. Go, because I'm going to use Paul. And you just wait and see. And he says, he puts in there, hey, Paul's going to suffer. He's going to suffer a lot for my name. So don't think he's getting away scot-free, Ananias. But listen, you just wait and see what I'm going to do through this guy. So go. And guess what? Ananias obeyed. He did it. He obeyed. Now, I can't imagine how scary it would have been to invite in the person who was banging down the doors to get in, to go to the person who was busting down doors and dragging people out and taking them off to jail and to go to him and say, would you like to come to my house today? Mm -hmm. Hey, just come on. That sounds crazy. That's not right, right? That's counterintuitive. And Ananias had no guarantee of Paul's conversion. The only evidence he had was that vision, that moment with the Lord. That's all he had to go off of. And so the amount of faith it had to take for him to invite this persecutor, this terrorist of the Christian church into his home had to be extreme, right? And Ananias had that kind of trust in the Lord because it kind of circles back to what we already said about him. He was intimate with the Lord because you can't trust someone you don't know. But Ananias knew Jesus. He knew the Lord through his relationship with him. So he trusted when he said, go, Go do this for me, Ananias. He did it. And Ananias' act of faith is astounding in this chapter. So we got two men. We got Paul and we got Ananias. And they're two very different men. They have two very different roles, but they teach us a few important things. So we'll just go through three things that they teach us in the text, okay? 
first of all, they teach us that God is working. And this was true back when Luke wrote Acts, and it's true today, right? God is working um, because Paul had a plan. He had an agenda. Um, he was supported in that agenda. He had power and influence. He was, by all accounts, going to accomplish it and accomplish it well. And God stopped that from happening. He totally disrupted that agenda. Um, and then Ananias, he didn't understand why God was calling him to do this thing. He was probably minding his own business, preparing preparing for the persecution that was coming to Damascus. And then God meets him in this way and calls him to do something pretty radical. Um, and, and it sounded crazy, but God's plan, as we can see from hindsight, right? Because we have the whole story now. God's plan was so much bigger than what these two men were experiencing in these few days here that we read this account. It was huge, right? God's plan was so much bigger, but their stories were a really big part of God's plan, right? They were they were really important to God's plan. So um, I wonder if there's been a time when you can think about that God has sort of disrupted you in your walk, in your plan, in your agenda, or maybe a time when God has asked you to do something totally crazy. And sometimes those two things go inside, right? Can you think about a time in your life when God has done that? And then how did it turn out in hindsight? And I'll share with you my own story of that. Um, if you've heard these stories before, I apologize. They're just transformative stories in my life. And so I tend to share them a lot. But um, when I when I was about to have our first child 10 years ago, um, my husband was in full-time ministry with his family. We didn't make a lot of money. And I was working full-time. And I wanted to stay home with my daughter. But my boss, I worked from home. And my boss is not going to let me work from home part-time. So I was going to have to put her in daycare and then come back home and work. And I just couldn't stand the thought of it. And I really was praying for God to give us a solution to, to allow me to stay home. And God laid on my husband's heart, this really crazy idea of doing real estate photography. He's like, he's like a go-getter. So he's like, I'll figure something out, Lenny. And so <laughs> he started taking pictures of houses for real estate agents. And this little, this little thing that he started doing started growing a lot. And we did it for about five years. And, and, and as we got about three, four years into it, now this thing was so big, it was like our, our, our second salary and God had really blessed it and it was doing great. And he was really, really busy. So we'd be on the road traveling, doing music. And then when he was home every day, he was doing real estate photography and videography, just this random thing God called us to. And then um, when I was pregnant with my third child and I was, I was, um, you know, pretty pregnant at this point, my husband and I had a conversation and I don't know if you guys have ever had one of these kind of conversations with someone close to you in your life, but it's that kind of conversation where like, you've been thinking about something with the Lord and they've been thinking about something with the Lord and you haven't talked about it together. But when you have a conversation together, you realize God's been working on both of you at the same time and you are in total agreement on it. And it's like, whoa, this is confirmation. So my husband and I had that conversation at a monkey Joe's, which I don't know if y'all know what a monkey Joe's is, but it's an indoor place. They have all these blow up things for kids to jump on. So while our kids were going nuts, they were just screaming everywhere. We were having this real intense spiritual conversation. And what we found in that conversation is that God had been leading both of us separately to this idea that it was time to let our, our business go. And we were really confused by like why that would be, but the fact that we both felt that way was his confirmation. And so we prayed about it together. And, and, and on a Saturday afternoon, I sat on our porch and I called all the real estate agents that we worked with. And I said, we're going to finish out our commitments, but we're not going to book anything new. And then I put the phone down and I just came inside and cried because I just burnt our whole business to the ground in, in a couple hours, you know? And I thought, Lord, what in the world are we doing? And I knew I was about to have this baby. And you know, when you have a baby, you got to pay for it. So <laughs> I had this insurance copay that was coming up and I didn't know really where that was going to come from. And, and so we went to church the next day and this couple came up to us that we really didn't know as an older couple. And um, they just said, Lord, we felt the Lord wanted us to give this to you. And we took it, it was a little card and we opened it up and there was a check in there for the exact amount of our insurance copay, the exact amount. And that couple had no idea. And, and, and they couldn't have known. And we, we got to tell them afterward how God used them in our life. But it was such a beautiful confirmation of this crazy thing God had called us to do. And it was God's kindness toward us. And now as we kind of get years and years out from that, I can see all the reasons why God asks us to leave. I don't think we'd be where we are today if we hadn't been willing to step away 
from that in that moment. But sometimes God disrupts us to show us he's working and our plans are not always his plans. And sometimes we need to realign with him. Okay. The second thing that Paul and Ananias' story teaches us is that Jesus loves his church. So there's that line in this verse that we kind of said we'd circle back to. And it gets me when you really think about it, like it's really an incredible line. Because in verse five of chapter nine, Paul says, who are you? Right. And Jesus answers with the most amazing answer I feel like he could have given. He says, hey, Paul, it's Jesus, which, by the way, that's pretty amazing by itself. Hey, Paul, it's Jesus. And then he throws in a descriptor after his name for good measure. Right. And he doesn't say, hey, Paul, it's Jesus, the son of God. Like, you got it wrong. <laughs> I am who I said I was. No, he doesn't say that. He doesn't say, like, it's Jesus. I'm the one who was with God at creation. Like, you, you totally you totally mistook who I was, right? He doesn't say, you know, it's Jesus. I am the fulfillment of, like you thought as a Pharisee that you do the law, that you could achieve the law, but I fulfilled it. I'm the only one who came from Paul. You don't have to stop working so hard. Okay, that's not what he says. He says, hey, Paul, it's Jesus, the one you're persecuting. And this one line shows us how much Jesus identifies with his people. In fact, it's so closely that Jesus is saying, you may as well be going to Damascus to persecute. Mm -hmm. You may as well be doing that. And and, and it shows us that um, we have union with Christ. Have you guys ever heard of that theological idea of union with Christ? It's a really beautiful theology throughout scripture that shows us that when we become Christians, right, and God's spirit indwells in us, we are not just with God. Like, it's not like his presence is near us. It's not even that Jesus is in us. You know, we talk about Jesus being on our heart a lot. Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father, but the Holy Spirit is in our hearts. And so that's a true idea, right, that Jesus is in us. But even more than that, we are in him. And this idea with union in Christ is that we are in him. We are kept in him. We are part of him and so because of that we share in what he shares so when 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 he we hurt he hurts right when we rejoice he rejoices and and the the opposite is also true like the power that resides in jesus we're in that we have that power or or the 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 airdom right the the what am i trying to say the um the thing you get when you when someone dies inheritance there it is yeah the inheritance that jesus has that's ours too because we are in jesus and and i wonder like what does that what does that mean that's that's gonna be a hard question but what does that mean for you guys to be in jesus like have you experienced that in your walk with the lord can i hear some some thoughts on union with christ i have a brain yes and uh, i come up because I just got to this As a lot of you know, I went to the Bahamas uh, left Friday and everything was just fine. We had a nice time coming back. We uh, were as was at the uh, Fort, Fort Lauderdale Airport. We flew from uh, Atlanta to, to uh, airport. Uh, I'm not a flyer. I haven't been on a plane for like 20 some odd years, right? Mm -hmm. But as I told, I wrote and I mean, text everybody and ask you guys for uh, traveling mercy. But uh, I felt fine. Although I had not been on a tra- on a plane forever, I knew that God was protecting us. But my faith was put to a test. Mm-hmm. Coming back, we were supposed to uh, board the uh, plane at 3.30. They kept putting it off and off, and so we didn't get on the plane until 4.30. Takes about an hour and 25 minutes to get from Fort Lauderdale Airport to Atlanta. <clears throat> and so, uh, uh, and about 20 minutes out, an announcement came on and it said that there was a bad storm Mm -hmm. in Atlanta. So we will have to, I think they call it, hold Mm -hmm. in the air for a while. Mm -hmm. So he said, it's going to be a minute. That means like 20 minutes. (laughs) Then he he, he, uh, kept saying, you want to have ding, ding, what's now? (laughs) And so we are running out of fuel. So we're going to have to, (laughs) so we're going to have to go to Pensacola, Florida. Mm -hmm. 
to get to refuel. Okay, so we went, and as he's landing, ding, ding, I keep hearing ding for us now. There was a storm here too, so the, the we, they cannot open the gate. So we have to stand, sit here for a minute until they open the gate, 15, 20 minutes. All we see, we see movement, they're about to open, and by the time he said open, are you that, on the ground at least? Yes. Oh, okay. By the time he yeah. said, <laughs> <laughs> by the time he said, open, we heard thunder. Uh, he said, oh, close they back. closed it back. Oh, so okay. we got to wait. That's another 20, maybe. Mm -hmm. And so then finally, they were able to open. They were able to go in and refuel. Then we're back in the air. Almost 20 minutes. See, 20 minutes. Ding, ding. We have got to. Uh, revert or uh, go right. to uh, reroute to the west because the storm is still in uh, mm -hmm. at the airport. So as we're going west, ding ding, <laughs> <laughs> the storm is here now. So we have got to hold. And I said, Dear God. <laughs> <laughs> and I start praying because we are up in the air. Hold it. We can't go anywhere. And I said, dear Lord. And as I'm praying, I see, and this is where I it, I saw a force. And it seemed like it just went all around the plane. Mm -hmm. It came and then it went and came and it was on the pilot and all through the plane. As I see that force, the person who was in the... Uh, near the window hitting me and saying, look at the lightning, look at the lightning. See, it's almost, and I'm just praying. Yeah. Lord. <laughs> and he hit me again, I say, if it's, I, I didn't even look. Mm -hmm. I say, if it's thundering, I know it's going to be lightning, stop poking me. <laughs> now, I got to concentrate on what the Lord is doing. <laughs> and what he was doing, he was showing me mm -hmm. that he was protecting that plane yes. from the lightning, from the storm, mm -hmm. and as I'm looking, everybody, not only did he, he help me and calm me down, nobody was saying anything. They were just sitting there. Mm -hmm. And I said, ooh, look at God. And I got so, mm -hmm. and so I said, you are actually taken, I've always read that you take us through a storm. I said, you're actually taking me through this storm. Mm -hmm. And as I said that, there was a peace that came on me. I could not explain it. I have never felt that before. Amen. But I said this, you are taking me through that storm and whether that storm takes me back to my family or that storm take me to my everlasting, you got me. Amen. And when that plane land, I said with a loud voice, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and that's... <laughs> this is for somebody here. I don't know. Whatever you are going through, don't give up because God has you. He actually takes us through those storms. I'm going to tell you all. We landed. Good. We landed at. Uh, Neither. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, the five out. Five. No, Listen, I, I wasn't sure I was going to ask that question because I didn't know how y'all would respond to that. But I'm really glad the Lord let me to ask that question because thank you. That that's a beautiful example of union with Christ because the peace of Jesus was in you. All understand it. And so, if you're Christian, which in a room like this, I think there's a good chance you are. You have that union with Christ. He keeps you in Him. It's a beautiful thing. And, and we see that Jesus loves his people in this passage in like several layers, okay? Mm -hmm. First of all, he loves his people most basically because he stops Paul from going to persecute them, right? He prevents Paul from hurting his church any further. But it's more than that. He loves his people because we see him having mercy and patience with Ananias. Say, okay, give me your questions. I'm, it's fine. Like, I'll answer them. It's okay. I understand you're scared, Ananias. I get it. And then we see that he loves his people because somebody kind of already said this here, right? But it wasn't just that he stopped Paul. That wasn't his plan. It could have been his plan, and that probably would have been enough just to shut Paul down. But he chose Paul. 
He chose Paul. He stopped Paul and he chose him. And why did he choose Paul? To declare the gospel to the Gentiles. And so he loves his people because he wanted everyone that was going to come to him to know. And Paul was going to be a big part of that. So we see the layer upon layer in which Jesus loves his people, his church. So don't forget that because it's easy to believe he doesn't, but he does. And then finally, we learn from these two men, right? We learned, so what do we learn? We learned that uh, God is working. Jesus loves his church. And we learn that the gospel will not fail, right? Paul was changed completely after the event on the road to Damascus. I mean, his whole life was transformed. He went from going uh, from someone who really valued status and pedigree and all of his accomplishments to someone who was radically humble. I mean, Paul was a really humble guy. Um, he went from believing that his works earned him favor with God to being the one who talked about grace in the Bible more than anyone else. Mm -hmm. God's grace. He knew he was saved by grace. He went from being persecutor Paul to pastor Paul. I can even imagine that transformation. He ended up writing about 13 of the 27 books in the New Testament. And all of these are letters to churches mm -hmm. to encourage them in their faith, to admonish them, to challenge them, to talk about the radiance of Jesus mm -hmm. that he saw that day on the Damascus Road to tell them about the grace that was theirs. That they didn't have to live by the law anymore like he once did, right? And he was someone who gave us some of the most profound theology on Jesus's teaching. So he took the gospels and what Jesus taught us in the gospels and he just like took them and expounded on them in ways it's like got to reread it a few times because you're like, whoa, that's deep. Okay. Paul gave us so much because God disrupted him that day mm -hmm. on the Damascus road because the gospel will not fail. And uh, Paul was someone by all accounts who was going to prevent the spread of the gospel. And God said, not on my watch. Mm -hmm. So the person that was preventing the gospel became the one promoting the gospel. Yeah. And God is able to do that. And then we have Ananias, who is someone that we actually never hear from again. There is someone named Sapphira at Ananias. It's a different Ananias. It was a, a common name in the New Testament. This Ananias, we don't hear from him again. I mean, he has this great moment, this incredible moment, this prayer. And then we don't really know what happened. So we know he probably didn't become a prolific evangelist because we don't hear him talked about. We know he didn't write any of the books of the Bible. Um, we know that um, he wasn't around sharing the gospel in the way that Paul was. We really don't know what happened because we didn't hear anything else from him. But Ananias... His little moment was so important. His, he was kind of like that couple in that church that walked up and handed my husband and I a check. He was confirmation for Paul in a big way. Yeah. He was obedient. That's right. That's right. He was obedient. That's right. I don't know if y'all... Virgin says it, but he says, Brother Paul. Brother yeah. Paul, he, Paul, he yeah. welcomed him yeah. into he, the he, faith. He, I, I, Absolutely. I, I, I That's that profound. Well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so Ananias' obedience and faith in God is so transformative to the story of Paul, right? He is one pushing Paul along into this ministry. So Ananias has this little small part, but this huge role to play in the story of advancing the gospel. Right. And so we see two men, two very different circumstances, two very different paths, and both of them are teaching us that the gospel won't fail. All right. Wait. So, yeah. Yes. Sorry. I wanted to also add something about Ananias that I think it's, it's easy for us to overlook. It's, it's very personal and intimate. Like, it would be very strange and odd if I just walked up to you and touched your face. Mm -hmm. as much as I love you and we have a relationship with you know we know each other I mean I wouldn't do that to Harriet I wouldn't do that to Sonia I wouldn't do that I could do that to my children because we have that relationship I'm comfortable with them they know me I'm their mom but to walk to to put your hand on someone's face because you trust God that much someone that you kind of fear I think that we should over, that's so important to think about that. Like you just wouldn't, even if you know someone, you just would not, it would not be, it wouldn't come, um, it wouldn't come easy to you to just do that, yeah. to just put your hands on someone's face. Yeah. And so that also, I think is a testament of how much he trusted 
God and how much he believed God and about his relationship with him as well. Absolutely. Also, think uh, with that same message that she just shared is that when folks come, come into this place, come into any place, even your home, and God said, I need you to minister to, because that's basically what he was doing, <laughs> then we are to do it openly mm -hmm. and with love. And that's what the putting it yeah. Yeah, Even if your hands are shaking when you do it, <laughs> but you yeah. still do it because mm -hmm. God told you to do it. Yeah. And there are times when we see people that we know God says that in our mind, there's no way you can change from that. Yeah. So we don't accept them the way that yes. Ananias accepted Saul at this point. But this story reminds me that I'm supposed to accept them mm -hmm. just like Ananias accepted Saul and said, my brother, my sister, mm -hmm. yeah. this is what God has for you. Yeah, and I think we can get that because we, we see people, oh, you know, I know what we need. Mm -hmm. You know, when we, we don't let it go. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really good. So we kind of come to the wrap up. Like we've we've kind of talked about the text. We've learned about these two men, but we just a reminder: uh, Paul and Ananias are not the main characters of Acts chapter nine. I know God is the main character of Acts chapter nine, as He is in every book of the Bible. And so we want to look at this book not as well. Let me be like Paul, or let me be like Ananias, but let me learn about who God is from this story. And what we learn is that God is working. We learn that Jesus loves His people. And we learn that the gospel won't fail. And so we can take lessons from Paul and Ananias, but we got to make sure we keep God as the main character of this portion of scripture. And so as we kind of wrap up, we'll just have some thoughts you can think about in your own heart and mind. Um, but, you know, I would just wonder how this encourages you today when you're reading through this. How does this encourage you? Maybe you kind of identify with Paul in the sense that you feel calling on your life and you feel that God is, has mm -hmm. called you to, to share the gospel and spread the good news or whatever that looks like for you. But you kind of need to be reminded of where you came from, you know, what he saved you out of. Sometimes we got to go back to that place um, because it's good to remember who we were and how he's redeemed us. Um, or maybe you feel a little bit more like Ananias, like you don't really have a really big story. Or people probably don't remember your name or not going to. Mm -hmm. But you know what? Your obedience is so significant to the kingdom of God. And, and maybe it's that, that question, like, God, what do you want me to do in obedience to you today? Uh, because what we see that is small, I don't know that Ananias ever realized how big that moment was mm -hmm. in the story of the gospel and redemption. Uh, but God saw it, right? And, and so your obedience matters. And maybe um, you're discouraged with the world that we live in, because it's very easy to be discouraged with the world we live in. And, and maybe you see people like we see Paul, and, and they're prospering in evil, and it's just frustrating. And, and we see that they're against God's people, and they, they hate God's people, and they hate the church, and they just seem like they're, they're doing just fine. And Paul's story, just like you were saying, reminds us like whoever that person is that you're like that they're too far gone that's not true paul reminds us it's not true i'm going to say the same deal that paul used in his first school church he used that same deal that's it's right right that's right mm -hmm. yeah absolutely so whether that person that comes to your mind is like too far gone never mm -hmm. whether that's like a family member a friend or whether it's a celebrity or a politician i mean whoever comes to your mind is like that's ridiculous they would never that's not true. Paul teaches us that is not true. And so I thought, and we got to wrap up, but I thought we could spend just a moment praying with ourselves, you know, just a minute or so for that person, that, that too far gone person that pops in your mind. And I, so I want to give us just a little bit of a quiet time to pray. And then I'm going to wrap us up in a prayer. And then I think maybe Letitia said there were some announcements. Um, mentioned that God is working around us all the time. He also calls us to join in, no That's matter right. who we are, where right. we are. Mm -hmm. And it's our choice to mm -hmm. obey or, or, you know, or love them. That's you right. Know, I'm not ready for this right now, whatever. Whatever That's right. he's doing. But he does ask us to join in like he did that in a man. And what a privilege that God yeah. would ask us to join in in his work. That's incredible. And we don't want to miss it when he does, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to give you all a minute to pray. Pray about that, that. That too far gone person, pray about that obedience that maybe God's calling you to. Sometimes it feels really hard and scary. I'm going to give you about a minute. We'll pray and then I'll close this up.
Lord, we just um, thank you for your word. God, we thank you for <laughs> the truth that you share with us, God, that we can come and learn about you. I'm so thankful you've given that tool to us. God, we lift up around the room names of people that come to our heart and minds that feel, honestly, just feel too far gone. Like it's silly to even think that they would become followers of Christ. But God, um, I love that, that someone pointed out the same zeal that Paul had was then to persecute the church was then used to spread the gospel. And God, I pray for the people whose names have been lifted up in this room, that you would transform their lives, that we would not stop believing that the gospel has the power to transform anyone for your glory. And God, we thank you that the gospel goes forth, that it won't fail, that you're still working and that you love your people. We thank you, God, that you love your church and that when we're persecuted, when we feel left out, when we feel that things are against us, you feel that too. And you are working in the world around us. God, let us, let our faith be strengthened. Let us be encouraged together in that. God, thank you for this class, for their participation, for their faithful study of the word. And thank you for Letitia's leadership, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Whitney, so much.